hue and fine carpentry. I've been teaching for Restoration Weekend for a long time. Israel, uh, my son, who's 13, has grown up at the Restoration Weekend. He's, uh, he's gone from able to carry anything to like carrying everything. So it's just a very good thing. Um, Israel, what, what have we decided? 10 and you did your first hardwood floor, you did your first plaster job, I don't know, like probably earlier than that. Um, <laughs> I'm telling you, he's a high commodity. My neighbor's bag more than that. Okay. Um, so anyway, I'm very proud of him. Um, very excited to be here. I love the Restoration Weekend. I met uh, one of my close friends. The, the, the masonry guy, chimney guy, fireplace guy. Um, he's done probably 50 jobs for me. He's just tremendous. I have an opportunity to come in his class. You should um, I met Dave here. Um, we've been friends for a long, long time. Uh, we had breakfast every morning in Camp Washington. So hopefully that tells you. There's some there's some camaraderie here that I think is a really beautiful thing, and uh, I, I love the event. My kids beg to come here. Uh, all they're like, when is a restoration weekend? Anyway, uh, without further ado, um, has, has anybody been to my plaster class before? So I can use my all my bad jokes, all my old schnick. This is great. All right. So. Um, just like I did my wood class, I sort of teach a little bit about the history of plaster, what you need to know so that you can properly assess what you're, what you're up against in your repair uh, process. So basically, these represent stud bays in a house. Um, these are modern studs. They're not, um, they're not dimensional lumber. They're actually um, uh, new studs that just look old because they were stored in a barn. Um, this is represent a 16 on stud bay. This is to represent sort of the first tier era of lath. How many people have seen lath in their house? Wood behind the wall. They're like, oh crap, one of those houses. Um, actually, it's a good thing because it's a really wonderful product that lasts for a long, long time if you take care of it. Um, wood lath strips. These are the uh, purposeful openings that basically when you um, put and apply the plaster to the wall, that it pushes that plaster into the key opening, into that opening, and it creates a little fist across the whole back, and that's what holds that huge, thick layer of plaster on the outside of the wall. Um, so these keys, these these spots are, are purposeful. Actually, in one of my houses, Scott Clark was there uh, working uh, with me one day, and uh, we found the plaster is nailed to the lath strip. It was crawling around and putting all the lath on. We found this bag buried in the wall. So we found it full of nails. We found the bag. It looked like a nail bib. It was pretty, pretty incredible. Scott still has it someplace at the History Museum. But, uh, and then uh, we move on. Um, and actually, last year I taught at the, the uh, South Gate Street Newport History Museum. The, the, the class is all online. If you watch that, you'll realize it was probably uh, way better than what I'm teaching you. So, uh, man. So, this is extremely flat. So, if you go from like the turn of the century, uh, 1870, uh, 1890 era house in Newport or uh, in uh, over the Rhine or where you were located uh, in the city, and you got this, then, then you're, you'll see a lot of this. Um, then, uh, as products changed, as, as manufacturing changed, uh, we start seeing what I believe to be actually a superior product. Now, there, it's very rare that you see a superior product come about as things age. This is one of them. Um, extruded metal lath, you imagine all those keys that were in here of the plaster. Well, now it has millions of keys. And it does not, even if the wall is, is there's trauma to the wall in one spot, then all of this other area holds that spot tight. It doesn't go anywhere. It's like one giant sheet of reinforced concrete. Um, I was just working on a house in, New in uh, Norwood about a week ago, and uh, I had to cut out the sewer stack. Um, the only access to the sewer stack was to the exterior stucco of the building, which is really terrible. Um, and so when I, when I went to remove that stucco, um, I initially hit it as hard as I could with a, like a 10-pound sledgehammer, and it didn't do anything. This is great. <laughs> oh, wait. I want my house to not do anything like hit with a 10-pound sledgehammer. So this is an extruded metal lath, this is wood lath, we talk a lot about those. And because mid-century homes now are uh, considered historic, uh, we have to address rock lath as well, which is like a, another product 
Um, if you encounter rock lath, it all has it. So you need to be careful that you don't cut it, you don't rip it out uh, willy-nilly. Um, I'm not going to tell you how to handle that, but if you're not doing it and you're touching your rock lap, you don't need to wear one of these. Did everybody hear that? Reverse psychology, right? Okay. So, negative air on the room, wet it all down with oil, make sure that you don't remove it. <laughs> so, this is um, rock lap. This mocked up rock lap. You can't really get it very easily. LNW has a few sheets of it at any given time. Um, but it's like a half inch to three eighths uh, gypsum board now. It used to be made of some other stuff. They're really, really heavy. Um, and they would have had uh, actually in between each one a edge. This is just a mock up. And they look like these, these like 16 or 20 inch strips. 18 inch. I can't remember what the size is on. Uh, but then the top layer. This mimics the initial scratch coat of the plaster and the board, and then on top of that, there's a top coat. Okay, so this is actually a pretty good product. Um, if you go into a plaster house built in the 50s or 60s, um, it's got this stuff. They're awesome. Really, really hardy product. Really, really good. Uh, problem with this is you start seeing pillowing. Uh, lots of pillowing on houses like this. Because, uh, the, the, you'll see each one of the boards. It'll start to release on the wall, and you'll start to see sort of that like checkered pattern. That a little bit of, about the process as well. So that's sort of like the history, and then, then we get the beautiful product, which is drywall, which is absolute garbage, and nobody wants to live on a house. And I'll say this in this house um, eventually, we'll start making houses that nobody wants to live in um, because they are beneath them. Um, houses made of cardboard are, are not worth living in. Um, doors made of cardboard aren't really doors, um, and they're, they're just they're terrible. Um, you can watch things soak water in and not last um, at all. And I have uh, a vested interest in making sure that the United States is still the best place on earth and the place where people are living. And they don't look at it and go, Ugh, you're living in trailer houses. Um, we need to be better than that. We really need to do that. So uh, that is uh, the, the next step beyond here. So that framework about what's behind the wall. Um, the next step is uh, the way that the plaster would have been applied. Uh, again, I talked about this. There's a three quarter of an inch to an inch of plaster on top of this, the first coat. Um, and the best thing that I can explain this uh, is that when I wrote a scratch coat on a stucco or when I wrote a scratch coat on an older house, they would not have done this, but I do this now. This is a Portland cement. This is just quick creep. You can get it pretty much anywhere. Portland cement. Um, Dave's going to tell you his opinion is evil. I would also tell you the same thing on brick. Um, but then, uh, quick brick also has all purpose about the proper aggregate to make a nice three to one. That's one Portland, three sand, scratch coat. Um, so if you make that three to one, that uh, produces this really gritty, rough stuff. Now, if you're, if you're into pre-mixed stuff that is lighter on your hot brow, there's a stuff down here, if you can see it, it's called Structolite. Um, it's a much lighter product, and so, you know, skinny guy that can't carry a hawk full of plaster or have a tray full of plaster uh, scoop, it makes it a lot easier to apply because then I can hold it and then I can push it. So, when I come to the wall, here, over onto my trowel, notice the, notice why I walk with a little bit of a limp. <laughs> That movement right there, that's like a full body workout every single time. So, uh, the lighter. So if you're doing a whole house, Structo is a really great product. I use a lot of Structo on the uh, History Museum in Newport. Um, for I also, uh, then on the top of that scratch coat, just so you know, um, I use a, another product I don't have um, that's uh, called Diamond. It's made by USG. It's a top coating plaster coat on the outside of that. And that is true plaster exterior. Um, it's modified a little bit now from an original plaster, but uh, I see no reason with modern products to use a traditional plaster when you're re redoing that work, unless it's for posterity reasons. Um, so uh, then you move on to here. This is the same process. Um, many times on a stucco, you'll have an exterior which is sheeted with a uh, tongue and groove. One by six, and then on top of that one by six, there will be uh, strips, and then on top of that, there will be this beautiful uh, metal extruded lath that you then push your uh, mix of one to three, one part Portland, three parts sand, to get your scratch coat. Um, good stuff. 
code formula, that's a good scratch code interior formula. Um, and then on this, then we get to more modern products. Uh, we're using either a premix uh, diamond by USG, which is a product that I use and I don't have a bag. I thought I did and I didn't. That's my fault. Um, or uh, you can also use a, a, a gypsum based product like uh, Durban. I mean, you can see my order. It's the brown bag. If you go to if you go to an orange store or a blue store and you ask for a Duramon, they're going to give you uh, easy stamp because they don't know the difference. Then you look at them with great disgust. And they'll say the easy stand is down there. No, you don't understand. It's like a communication problem for the home people. They're, they're taught to regurgitate things that they don't understand. So this is Duramon 90. This will give you. Probably 30 minutes to set up, maybe if you're lucky. Um, and then what I use on top of traditional modern plaster, it's easy sand pots, just based, it's a setting type compound. Super much like drywall and requires sanding. Um, you can float it, and by floating, I mean it forms a crystal water layer on the outside. And then when I take a pool float and I hit it, it slides nicely. Because the water bead is right on top of it. So those are all different methods of plastic um, that we see going ad nauseum into the history of plastic work. Um, most people come to this class because of cracks. They come to this class because they have pillowing. They come to this class because they have missing pieces. Now, there is a technique that I use when I'm dealing with a crack that I will share with you that I think is very helpful. Um, you can imagine that this uh, board right here is missing, and that there is a crack in the wall of the plaster. You can start seeing a little hairline crack through here, and when you touch the plaster, it's, it, the sheet's actually released. But if you push on it, it moves. You touch it, it moves a little bit. The way that I handle that is a big inch drill bit, just like this, okay? And then I drill through the plaster, and so it's around that crack. Make sure that I'm really gentle. You want to be really, really gentle, okay? Because the plaster is just a big piece of uh, big piece of stone that's loose on the wall and being held no more by heat that used to be released. Okay, they've broken off. It's released, and so you have a little sheet of plaster that's broken. So you drill out each. One. Then you take your vacuum. You suck out all the dust from that. Um, after that, sorry, I just taught another class, and so I'm kind of some of my blocks here. Once I do that, then I take, um, I really like the heavy duty peel adhesive. It has acrylic in it. Uh, it has polyurethane in it. Um, I pump inside that hole that I just irritated. Pump the heck out of it just until it won't go in anymore. Okay. Then, um, once I pump it in there, I take a screw, a fender washer. You know, a fender washer is a very large metal washer. Under the washer, I put a rubber bushing. Uh, looks an awful lot like that. That only big. Okay. Each parts it, and each part or so. And a screw. Then, I have that on hand. It's irrigated with the adhesive, it's drilled, and then I apply Acryl 60 to it, which is just a master seal. It used to be called uh, uh, Thermos Seal. A uh, master seal product is just an acrylic product to that crack so that it solidifies that whole crack there. It's going to basically glue it together once it's, it's adhered. You're doing that with a top coat? I put, I paint it on so that it saturates in the crack. Okay. And then I take the screws that have a little relief because of that rubber bush. And I put them in the hole and then I tighten it down. I let it dry overnight until that, that polyurethane that I pumped in there is hard as a rock. I glued the rock back to the wood. You can glue, you can glue plaster to wood with polyurethane and acrylic. That's the trick. Polyurethane is sticky like like a like gum, and the acrylic is hard as a rock. It's like plastic. And so it does both. Then once that's adhered, you withdraw the screws. 
plaster screws in. People make this mistake all the time. They're like, well, I still have these huge bumps where you told me to put the plaster screws in. It's because the plaster screws come out. They make something called a plaster washer uh, that people use a lot. It's the same thing of giving relief to it and spreading the overall surface area of the screw. It's expensive for no reason. Just make them yourself. You probably only need five. And then you draw that back to the side of the plaster to that you reestablish something like a key but not a key and that makes that area stabilized then once that happens you can then um, apply and this is not a historically approved product although all of us use it. all of them. I mean I, I don't know any plaster in the city that does not use flip wall um, if you show them to me I'll ask him why he can teach the class um, flip wall is like a dryer sheet It's applied by putting your first layer, and on a situation like that, uh, I need to back up a little bit just to rehearse something. Gypsum-based drywall mud absorbs water. Plaster resists water. Do you see why these two things don't meet? They don't match. There has to be something in between the two in order for them to adhere to one another. Gypsum absorbs water. Plaster so that's the key. When you're doing the crack repair, you have to know that the whole area has to be painted with something like these. Aqua 60 is much better. It's usually Pepto-Bismol paint. You can see where it is. Uh, concrete bonding agent readily available at every hardware store in the universe. Um, the concrete aisle is the exact same stuff, only a little less uh, potent, a little less sticky, a little cheaper. Um, this is like probably 30, this is like 9, give you a little idea. Plaster weld the same? Um, plaster weld actually I think is, uh, there's something else besides acrylic in it. This is almost a straight acrylic. But you're right, plaster weld is a great product to use. Um, I don't have access to plaster weld when I'm sort of on the fly. I could probably order a skin of it. Yeah, no, that's a great idea to, to use plaster weld. Um, so once you do those things, um, you prep the surface to make sure that the resisting plaster doesn't resist the same water that's absorbed into the drywall and for it to all fall off. Then I use something which doesn't really well at all, Durabon. The Durabon has acrylic in it and it will bond to everything. Um, it is hard, it is mean, and it floats. It's just wonderful stuff. That thinned out version of Durabon that goes on the wall first. Then you put a sheet of glue wall over the crack, okay? Generously over the crack. Once that is on, you then skim it off with your knife, you know, and hold it down to the corner, pull it so that it pulls all of that knife Durabon through. See how it's coated? Forms like a very, very. I think people use, used to use uh, mesh tape this way. Just layers and layers and layers of mesh tape. I pulled it all in. This does the same thing like that. It's like fiber left reinforcement for the face of the, the plaster. And you can do a whole wall. I mean, it comes in this. It comes a huge roll sheet. You do walls this way. What is that called? It's made by Glidden. It's like a dryer sheet. Um, readily available like LMW Supply. I think they carry it at Doppies. Um, I get a lot of it. Uh, where uh, m and Drywall Supply, or Spring Road, they've got it as well. Um, and, uh, that's a really great product for historic folks because uh, you can do lots of different repairs that way. You can repair a crack that way. You can also repair missing pieces that way. Um, so that's a crack repair. The second repair that I would walk you through that I think is really helpful is if you've got a piece missing. Say it's a no more than a 16 by 16 piece, probably this big, missing. There are lots of ways that you can consider if the lath is still in existence, right? If this is the metal lath that's still there, chances are it's not a 16 by 16 chunk that's missing. It's bigger or smaller. Most of the time, if you've got a 16 by 16 chunk, it's here and there's been massive trauma. Um, you know, 
kids are running in the house, their butt hits the wall, it cracks the lab. He's leaving, he walked out on it. Uh, they never do that. Uh, dad gets, you know, crazy angry and decides to aim on the wall. I don't know, you know, it never happens. So there's a, there's a whole lot that can happen that traumatizes the lab and, and sometimes it'll flex and then release the plaster. If that's the case, you look, let's just say the lab's still there. We're going to coat the heck out of it with Acryl 60, just smear that on. We're going to let it dry sticky and then we're going to apply a small coat of Structolite, which is a readily made gypsum based, uh, base coat plaster. Um, that's going to get it too. Take your trowel and make some hash marks in it to give it like grip. You don't want it smooth. You don't want to float it smooth. You can be really picky and say, oh, I'm going to make this really pretty on the first coat that nobody's ever going to see. You need to hash mark it. Make sure it's got some grip. Um, so that's the first coat. Second coat, I would hit um, Duravond is a uh, brown bag, Duravond 90, since you haven't done this a lot. Um, I would spin it up pretty wet and then make it so that it's about the consistency of peanut butter and just float it in there. Let that dry. You want it concave. You want it to have little troughs. Okay? And then on your final coat, you're going to float over the top of that with your, um, your top coat, but you've got to apply the, this first. Okay? So, First coat of missing is going to go back to the lab, and that's going to be the Structolite. The second coat that's going to go on top of that to build it up is going to be a Duravon, so that it'll stick. And then on the third coat, you're going to hit it with an, an easy sander, a sandable, and apply the glue and squeegee it off. Your fourth coat is going to be that same easy sander, and you're going to pull it off and sand the heck out of it. Probably something 16, you imagine a foot on every side. Feathers it out, nobody will ever see. Um, and uh, the cleaner, I told somebody this in their house the other day. My job is about 10% craftsmanship and about 90% cleanliness. The cleaner you keep everything, the better. Your job will be 100% better. And so you have to make sure that everything stays nice and clean, nice and dry. Um, and that's really, really good. Um, so that's purposeful. On a situation where you've got uh, a problem with extrusion, or it's dented in like that, you have to remove the old. Um, the best way to do that is with a small, um, I use a small hammer drill. Um, you've got to be very careful with some of this stuff. Vibrations can actually do more damage than not. Um, if you notice that it's flexing the whole wall, you stop and you do a bunch of things. You have to remove the chunks that are missing or where it starts and get back to good. And then you do the almost Process to that that I just showed you. Okay. Go, go back to the lab. You don't wet yes. the lab before you get the line. There you go. Old school when I didn't have this, I put wet it before you put this. And the reason for that is so that it doesn't suck the moisture out of your out of your plaster. You apply this, you don't have ain't no moisture coming out. No. It's just like plastic on top. So it sort of avoids the step. I mean. Sure, like the edges of your plaster, if you're really concerned about them wicking, I mean, you keep a bucket of water, I just smear water on every my, all my tools, keep them nice and clean. That's what that's for. Right. I mean, it's like, but you don't care. Well, I'm like a gold farmer. Yeah, no, gold. No, no, no. I'll just like um, urinating. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty good illustration. This is the last missing good, good process to go. Let's step one step back. Take the plaster off to the nearest stud. Um, a lot of the time I take a, I've got a shot that I attach to a um, small either Dremel or to a, a blade saw. And I have a tile blade that I use to dip cut right at the stud. And that my shop back, take that oscillator and dip right alongside of that stud. Very little vibrations, affecting the rest of the wall. You want to be nice and kind to the rest of your, your plaster. It starts getting bigger and bigger. And you're like, Screw it, I'm moving. <laughs> Call the real estate. So, you know, uh, 
thin slice both sides to make sure that it's a nice, nice uh, side. Some people, um, and you know, I've, I've seen people who are in this building today um, and work together with them, they've used drywall as a patch. They've used it just a piece of half inch, five eighths, back there, back it, and then they threw it on and topped it. And it looks pretty, and it works. It's probably that's a long time. I think that a better solution is probably just this to replace these glass strips, just make glass strips. And in that situation, I would say you're probably going to water because it's it's going to actually adhere then to that wood in a way. It's not if I have glass on the outside of wood, and then I have a plaster that has uh, has a bonding agent in it. It's bonding the plastic. It's not actually saturating into the wood. So in that situation, I probably prefer to go back to a style and to do the bonding agent. Whereas if it's old and it's got dust on it, it's got tons of crap, I want to lock all that stuff in with glue. Um, that's going to be, uh, I think, an optimal. optimal. It's opinion. Um, that's what I would do. But uh, there are definitely different ways to, uh, to approach that. Um, and then on the Maybe there is. 
is something structurally going on. Um, I have seen a situation where uh, you've got a bottom plate on a wall. So this would be a bottom plate. Uh, the bottom plate starts to uh, either rot or have termite damage or have branch or whatever it is that starts to make it sag. So it, it drifts and it kicks out. Um, and so then it's actually the whole wall has moved um, and the sheet's still intact. Sometimes our fears are wrong, but I'm here to confirm all of your fears. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I put paneling off, there's a reason. So, you know, like, you know, I put paneling on everything. Like, there's a reason. <laughs> you know, it's a good I, I, I would tell you that it's worth it. The walls are beautiful um, and, and worth making your house. Somebody sprayed water on the outside of the house. I do want to hand uh, on a masonry wall. I did not talk about masonry walls at all when I talked about plaster, but for years they applied uh, plaster directly to the exterior, uh, two course, three course brick. Um, and what happens frequently is the tuck pointing on the outside, which they will handle excellently, the best of the best, in my opinion. Um, and uh, he, he'll address that. that plaster and take mineral deposits and all the calcium that's in it and it'll pull it right outside the paint. It bubbles up, it chalks, chalks the plaster, you, everybody's seen it, like I just cut out I don't know, three days ago. Um, that's exactly the box cutter back. Released water into the house, it didn't have anywhere to go, it went right through the plaster. And, uh, so in that situation what I do is I cut out the So you cut out the, the rotten stuff back to the brick. What I do is I tint the whole thing. It's a smaller, like say it's this big. I tint the whole thing. And I, I ran an industrial dehumidifier. Tuck the thing dry as a thumb after the tuck pointing's done. Like, okay. I don't tuck it until the pointing, until the box gutter, until whatever the issue that was causing that water. If you don't, then it's just still in there. I'm going to wait for me to do it the second time. Um, then, after that, I make sure that it'll never come back in my spot. I coat the heck out of it with that. Probably two or three coats. I glue, glue that whole wall so that it absolutely. Because I don't want to reintroduce water to that wall. Well, it seals the bricks so that. Um, you're in this 
somebody doesn't do that, then chances are you're going to fight it for two or three go rounds. And I see this guys, you know, a couple of my guys that I trained, that I talked to, that you repair work with. You know, John, I did this and it didn't come through. You know, like I had to do it three That's why. Because they had not sucked all the humidity out of the wall for a long period of time. You need to take maybe two, three days with an industrial dehumidifier, drawing all that water out of the wall. If you don't, then the relative humidity inside of that wall is still high and it's going to come back through. Only not in this spot. Sorry, I'm super opinionated about exposure. Terrible idea. The reason for that is that that brick is held together by that plastic. That mortar is held intact by that plastic. Um, in the 90s and 2000s, it looked cool. I don't even think it looks cool anymore. I can't tell you how many houses I had to go back to because they're all chalky. They're, they get dust on the floor, and I had to put silence the locks in all the wall. And then I'm reintroducing some toxic chemical to the wall. It's just um, if, if it's get the humidity out so that you can replaster and reapply the top, um, um, plaster has a lifespan to repair and replace it every time. But do that really spare. In my opinion, that's don't equivocate. <laughs> I don't equivocate. Um, I'll tell you what. Is there any use of kill?
too much damage from five minutes. Other questions? Yeah. Is there It's just where they hung stuff and holes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in those situations, it's really simple. Um, create a law with Acryl. You don't really have to do that. Um, you can use a product that's already got acrylic in it. You can use a PL brand adhesive. Um, it's got acrylic in it. Pump it so that it's got some toothy to grip to. And then top coat it with. I would say that at that point you can probably just do what you need to be sanitized um, or with their bond, float it out. Uh, but remember, every bit I mean, has got to be floated big. So that you get that, that feathered edge all the way out. I'm not going to see a 30 second of an inch, which makes me, I mean, absolutely great. I, I legitimately want to be sane some days because I see. Every end, to every one of the wallpaper, it drives me wait, wait 20 years old. So yeah. you please, at least. <laughs> so, yes, that, that's how I would that's how I'd do this whole thing. But you want to make sure that the plaster is not released. That's super dangerous. Because what I see happen. Sometimes what happens is you use the inappropriate bonding agent to the plaster itself. There's a little humidity or moisture behind it somehow. I mean, even, I've seen this, and this is no joke. You could dump a uh, uh, 1950s era house, you could dump, uh, accidentally dump a Coke on the floor. It's tilted over, you forget it, it's a party. Glass of wine goes through the ceiling.
exterior product, I still don't tell Dave wherever. I still use one part Portland, three parts sand to my scratch pad. Um, I spin a little acryl in that so that it's going to bond to everything. You will bond your hands, bowling balls together with it. It's amazing. And they also make modified epoxies too that are really, really nice. It's my learning curve. I still have a lot. Um, the epoxies are awesome. Uh, the, uh, Janelle Supply is a great place to start picking up things. Sorry, I can't wait. Um, I'm really mad at you. Oh, I know. I was at the other one. Can, can you see uh, Glidwall? wall? I did. Okay, um, never mind. Then. I did. I did. This is okay. wall. Um, yep. uh, technically, this is an inappropriate to use in any sort of preservation environment. However, everybody uses it. Um, I apply a uh, setting type compound or a Durabond 90 to a wall. Um, first, super thin, I roll it on. Large section, roll it on. Um, I so basically, I hold one hand, um, take the edge of your knife, and it'll be wall. You pack it, and you start rolling. Mm -hmm. Get it all the way on, barely hung. You come back, we're all trout. Um, and I pull off, I use a hog. I travel around New England with a group of uh, guys building hogs. They the rest of the AMC movie theaters. So that's what I did. So, you're going to pull that excess curve on, and that's all you're doing. And Gary, you're using a food border a lot of time, and right? Well, it's like, you know, and doing I mean, top coats. Are you talking about the blue board in the way of Dow? Or, um, I guess, like, in New England, they they typically, do they typically do, like, um, they, like, I don't even know what it's called. They, like, Kind of drive along and they like do an entire skin coat over the whole thing with a different Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, especially when you're doing a top coat like this. This is what it looks like. Right. Um, but you don't use glue wall in those situations. You're yeah. Right. You right. don't want that. Yeah, it's a top coat. It's probably an eight inch thing. Is glue wall like, I, when I went to my research, it seemed like it's specific to Cincinnati. Is that true at all? Mm -hmm. or, I mean, if you yeah. get online, you look at all the YouTube videos about how to. Yeah. I just thought, yeah, I, when I was looking up, I feel like there were a yeah, uh, this old house, they talk about it a lot. Okay, yeah. Which I'm not supposed to bring that up. Everybody here kind of hates this old house now. Okay. <laughs> Norman, I'm just like my hero. You know, like, he's retiring. Um, he's, or his, his career was 43 years old. That's how old I That's the long Yeah, yeah, yeah he was great. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool. He's retiring. His career is as long as my life. <laughs> Man, what a great career. We, we did live on Good product. It'll last forever. I, I, I mean, I'm not gonna say it lasts forever. It lasts, you know, probably a long period. Uh, it's a it's a great repair for a long period of time. Uh, any other questions? I don't know. It's supposed to wrap up. But so, I don't really care. So on YouTube, what would you look up? Uh, just type in glid wall repair. Glid wall. Glid wall. Um, and uh, like glid. Oh yeah. It's expensive, like it's crazy. It's, it's like two hundred dollars a roll or something. Oh yeah, uh, and yeah. now everything's about twice as much. Right. I mean, I'm sure that this is going through. Like, and it comes in a roll this big. Um, you can buy the dobbies. Uh, they carry a roll, and they'll pull off however much. Um, yeah. Mesh or something now that it's sort of takes the place of. I mean, it can't get much easier than rolling shoes like wallpaper in it. Uh, I think we got to wrap up. Thank you all so much. Uh,